from you. And uh, Mr. Britton sent me actually a list of 10 things <laughs> that he thought might, might be in prison for you. And uh, the first one was that uh, we see the world, we tend to see the world through these artificial subject divides and they just happen to be the way we uh, divide things up in school and in our education system and that's just a human overlay we don't need to um, see the world that way or divide the world in that way um, other other imprisoning factors there's a pressure on people to decide what careers they're going to follow there's an idea there are ideas and values about what a uh, good career is and what a good path educationally is to achieving that so-called good career. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of standardized milestones related to study and personal development and, and each can carry this sort of immense pressure. Um, and yet you are all totally unique uh, with a myriad different talents and interests and um, and imaginations and if we were to spend the afternoon this afternoon together and I said let's all make sculptures I'm sure you'd all make something totally different and you are all the um, the sculptors of your own lives so I would expect each of you to carve out your own unique path so that was the intriguing and inspiring background to to this talk that uh, you're about to hear but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me beyond um, what Mr. Britton said. And um, I did start out with a physics degree. Uh, I then joined a big international management consultancy and did business and IT work for quite a few years. And it was then I went to art school and I did a four year fine art painting degree. And um, after that degree, I asked myself, what can I now do with this newfound art knowledge? And I was really passionate that I wanted to do something positive, something optimistic, something that contributed to the world and said something really positive about the way humans see the world and how we see the world. Um, and that's what took me to Imperial College, which is kind of my local university. I live in Brentford in West London. And so it's a six mile cycle down the road, basically down the Chiswick High Road. And um, and so that took me to Imperial. Why? Got lucky, I sent a couple of emails out and I met a scientist who helped me get started. And that was 10 years ago when I created this project, Finding Patterns. And during that time, I've had this tremendous luxury to um, have this freedom to ask anything that I'm curious about of any of the people I, I've met during that time, different academics from different universities or whatever. And I've also had the tremendous luxury to experiment with finding different forms of expression for for different ideas um and so you know this talk right now is just before the 10th anniversary of my project so it's a really great moment for me to take stock and my aim is to share with you just a little of how i see the world it is a faceted and it's a faceted talk it's a colorful rainbow of perspectives and I um, hope you enjoy the uh, the journey. So, with no further ado, let's um, start. Okay, I'm going to start the uh, the uh, video presentation. Uh, just to let everyone know, this meeting is being recorded, so um, you're aware that you're going to be uh, um, uh, kept for posterity. And if you have any questions, any point, if you enter them into the comments section at the end, I will read them out and Geraldine will respond to them. OK, so feel free to do that. I'm going to broadcast the video now. Is it playing? Okay. 
It doesn't seem to be playing any at the moment. Um, I can't. Okay. Sorry. Excuse me. Hold on one second. Bear with me. I think I know what the problem was. I've made a fully illustrated talk for you. That's in four sections. And we're going to begin by zooming out from ourselves and our everyday lives to look at the life of our universe and consider where, where we fit in. We're going to talk about the things that seem distant and ancient, but I'd like to show you how they are here and with us forever. And we'll consider examples of the patterns that thread their way across the universe through space and time. We're going to return to ourselves to take a look at the way humans divide up the world into subjects and playfully consider how they might be different. And we'll close by reflecting on our own unique journeys through space and time. And we're going to discuss art, and science and poetry. And I'm going to introduce a few inspirational guests from these fields, some of whom are not so well known, though they are important. And I hope you will enjoy the trip and maybe form some new perspectives of your own. So to begin, part one, we are brand new and just figuring out how to live. Our universe is almost 14 billion or 14,000 million years old. This is a span of time barely comprehensible to human experience. And so what I'd like to do is shrink 14 billion years to just one year, shown by this pale blue line. And this is a year, the time it takes our Earth to circle our sun. And the beginning of the line is on the left-hand side is the 1st of January. And on the right-hand side is the other end of the year, December the 31st. Just as the New Year's Eve bells begin to ring on January the 1st, our universe is born at zero hundred hours. It is a tiny, immensely dense hot dot of matter and light particles. And during the first split second, there is this tremendous expansion and some of the matter particles join to make the first simplest atoms. The universe continues to expand. And on January the 3rd, the first stars light up. They are clouds of hydrogen atoms marshaled together under gravity. And the lifespan of these early stars is, is relatively short and each lights up and then dies a few hours later. As time and space unfold, billions of stars come and go. And new stars are often formed from the ashes of dead stars. So take a moment, take a moment to think when our sun might first appear during this year. September the 2nd is the approximate date of the birth of our star, our sun. It is a star that will live until around spring next year. Around four days later, our Earth is born on September the 6th. On September the 21st, we have the beginnings of life, microscopic microbes, just, just single cells. On September the 30th, something very important, photosynthesis, this is a hugely important step, enabling more complex life to thrive. So cyanobacteria emerge that use the sun's energy to manufacture sugars, sugars to build and power life and create an oxygen rich atmosphere for life to breathe. And eventually in early December, cooperating cells become simple life forms, 
like sponges. Fish and land plants and seeds and insects follow in a great explosion of life. Dinosaurs arrive on Christmas Day and are gone in a great extinction event four days later. And mammals and birds and flowers flourish. So we come to December the 31st and at 12 minutes before midnight on New Year's Eve, the first human ancestors are born and they develop writing 12 seconds before the clocks chime. So during the 12 seconds that follows, our entire world takes shape. All of our social, political, technological developments and structures are here. And all of us, the living humans, are the last one quarter of a second. And since life began around September the 21st, there has been an exponential growth in complexity. And this is because as life reproduces itself over and over, nature tirelessly experiments and most crucially records every successful result as DNA instructions for future creatures. Here is a beautiful example of complexity in a drawing of a single neuron cell in the human brain made in 1898. And these are cells in the retina of the human eye drawn over 100 years ago in 1904. The creator of these remarkable drawings is Santiago Ramon y Callal. I'm, I'm sure I've said that wrongly. The neuroscientist, artist, and photographer. He was also a bodybuilder, a chess player, and a cannon builder. And he's thought of as the father of neuroscience and was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on the, on the nervous system. So I've outlined a history of the universe from its beginning as an infinitely tiny dot. Some of the things I have just discussed may seem ancient and distant, but I want to show you how they are still here. Everything is everywhere. Before that, let's take a moment to introduce an important artist who I feel really embodies this idea. Here is Hilma F. Klimt, born in Sweden almost 160 years ago in 1862. And if I ask you to guess who the first abstract artists were, maybe you would think of people like um, Vasily Kandinsky and Piet Mondrian. But in fact, Hilma was the first abstract artist. History missed her out until very recently for she was discouraged from sharing her work and the world did not see it until the 1960s, some 20 years after her death. And here is an exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. And for me, Hilma's work, like these giant watercolor paintings on paper, each actually painted in a single day, embodies the idea that everything is everywhere. There are light beams, tiny particles, living organisms, force fields, and stars. So to return more precisely to our topic, I'd like us to try a simple thought experiment. Take a moment to recall when you last looked up at the moon. Try to think of the size that it was in the sky. If you had different eyes that could see different light, you would see this speckled pattern wherever you looked across the sky, day or night. And each speckle is roughly the size of our moon in the sky. It is the microwave light and it is the most ancient light in our universe. So returning to our timeline, this giant speckled egg was born at 14 minutes past midnight on January the 1st. And by then the universe had expanded and cooled enough that light could travel unhindered without ceaselessly scattering 
on charged particles. And most of you have detected it. If you have ever heard the crackle of an old radio or a TV, a small, though significant amount, around half of 1% of that crackle is this light. And we are bathed in it always. This is called cosmic microwave background light. Stars are really important. Throughout time, they have been coming and going. Now we think there may be around 1 million, billion, billion in the universe. And around 300 million are born and die each day. And stars are the factories, the industrial centers of our universe. They fuse atoms together to make heavier atoms and release them into space when they die or explode in gigantic supernovae explosions. And I imagine you may all know this table as the periodic table of elements. These are the tiny particles, the atoms that make the entire world. You could also call it the table of stardust or more precisely the table of Big Bang and stardust. As we travel from the top to the bottom, the ordering is from light to heavy, simple to more complex. And the two simplest atoms, hydrogen and helium, at the very, on the very top line, were born in the first seconds after the Big Bang. And everything else is the product of long extinct stars. And we are mostly made of these four atoms marked out by the magenta stars. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. As um, incidentally are the trees. Uh, so we are Big Bang and stardust. And this is our star, our sun. It is, it has a dynamic and explosive surface. And so we are looking at one of the largest explosions recorded. The Earth is very small in, com in comparison, similar in size to the blue dot shown here on the right. And we are much further away than indicated here. We're 150 million kilometers away. So if the sun is about the size of a basketball uh, and the Earth is a two millimeter dot, we need to place that dot about 30 paces away from the basketball sun. And the sun's gravity holds us in orbit and its sunlight makes possible all life on Earth and provides almost all the energy. Without it, there would be nothing, nothing at all. And humans have long, have long recognized its importance. Here is an Egyptian relief carving of Nefertiti and Akhenaten, pictured over 3000 years ago. And Philip Larkin wrote this poem called Solar, which I, I think capture well, captures really well the sun's vital significance. Suspended lion face, spilling at the center of an unfurnished sky, how still you stand and how unaided, single stalkless flower, you pour unrecompensed. The eye sees you simplified by distance into an origin. Your petaled head of flames continuously exploding. Heat is the echo of your gold. Coined there among lonely horizontals, you exist openly. Our needs hourly climb and return like angels. Unclosing like a hand, you give forever. And here is sunlight shown as a spectrum of the particles of light we call photons. And the size of each photon here reflects the energy that it carries. The smaller red squares are low energy photons of infrared light. So this is the light that we feel as heat on our skin. And the largest blue squares are high energy photons of ultraviolet light. And UV light burns our skin and damages our eyes, but we can't see it. And the colorful array in the middle is the thin slice of the light spectrum, the visible light that we see with our eyes. 
And I think it is a marvelous thing that we can map out relationships like this. And I like to think of graphs and their beautiful relations as potential artworks too. So here is the design again, this time as a three meter square collage spectrum of sunlight. And each cut piece is inspired by the sun and was made by a different person. And there is so much further to go with this as we can reorganize the photons in different ways. At the other end of the size scale, I made this small oil painting about the size of, of my hand. It is the color of sunlight and traces the temperature of the sun from its core at an unimaginably hot 15 million degrees Celsius on the left-hand side to 6,000 degrees at its surface, the lowest point about a third from the right. And the light energy that is produced in the center takes roughly around 100,000 years to escape and then eight minutes to reach our eyes on Earth. Have you, um, have you ever looked at the sunlight that falls to the ground through tree leaves on a sunny day? It has a, um, a curvaceous feel, and that is because you're seeing lots of images of the sun. And to prove that point, here is the effect during a solar eclipse. You can think of space as being full of images and the gaps between the leaves allow particular images to reach the pavement. I mean, what an idea that images are everywhere in space. And yet we shouldn't be that surprised for wherever we put our eye, we see something. And don't forget, we only see visible light. So we can only imagine at the vast quantity of information passing through every single tiny bit of space. So I was, um, I was curious to know if I could select images like the gaps between the leaves. And this very basic apparatus is the result. I call it light printing. On the left, I made the image, in this case, an X cut into a sheet of paper. This is our, our sun-like object. And then an array of holes like the gaps between the leaves. That's what I call the selector. And the tracing paper screen on the right is like the pavement. And if my image is a flower and I arrange, I arrange the holes in a circle, I get this. And here I've made a troop of dancers and a hand holding a star, for we are all stardust. Images are everywhere and every cubic inch of space is a miracle, as Walt Whitman said in his poem, Miracles. So in part three, I'd like to focus our minds on the patterns and phenomena that thread their way through the universe and are everywhere. When I started my project at Imperial College, I made this small oil painting on stretched Japanese paper. And it was inspired by a scientist who would explain ideas to me by writing on his window. And this seemed like a, this seemed like a good metaphor for the way we look out at the world through science and particularly physics. We look for patterns and relations between things and we hold these patterns up against what we see to see how they compare. And mathematics has a special role here for it's the language of this activity and it helps us describe and then recognize the reoccurring patterns and phenomena that pop up in diverse places. So here is one of the simplest and most prevalent phenomena in the universe, the simple oscillator. It is so familiar to us. We give it a nudge and it swings outwards only to run out of momentum and fall back to overshoot and rise up again, lose momentum again and so on and so on. And it turns out that the modest displacement of a pendulum as it swings through time maps perfectly to that of a uniformly rotating wheel observed sideways on. And so in mathematics, we use the language of rotating circles to describe this pendulum motion. And if you 
trace the displacement of the pendulum as you travel through time down the screen, you get this lovely waveform. And so we also use the maths of rotating circles to describe waves. And I call this design harmony. And it brings together oscillations and waves and rotating circles, for they can all be thought of as different representations of the same thing. I made this, uh, this oil painting to celebrate the myriad oscillations that make up our world. We can start at the bottom, the longest line representing the great pressure waves of matter and light at the beginning of the universe, so 0, 0,00 hours, January the 1st on our time scale. And as we travel upwards, we come to the cycles of our sun, our earth years and days, the waves of our brains, the beating of our hearts, and the sound of our voices. The strumming of quartz crystals is that sort of pale band in the middle, and the unimaginably fast oscillations of all the different types of light from radio, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, up to X and gamma rays, or the rest of the dashes running to the top. And there are over 6,000 painted dashes and it's doubling our frequency. So that the top line is 10,000 billion, billion, billion times faster than the bottom. Such is the vast spectrum of... I've made two pendulums from some sweets here, a green fruit pastel and a yellow fruit polo. And they're in the corner of my studio connected by a a cotton thread that is pinned to the walls. So let's give one a push. So you can see that they talk incessantly. And this is because they share the same length and we say they are resonant. There is this tremendous transfer of energy from one to the other and back again. And maybe you've felt this idea of residence resonance in life when you you hit it off with someone or find the perfect expression of an idea and if you vary the length of, of one of them they are no longer resonant and the conversation is lost part of my work is running workshops in schools mostly with students around 10 years old this is a workshop about atoms so you can visit worldofatoms.com if you'd like to find out more and this student has taken a metal plate mounted on a stick and scattered salt on the surface and is pulling a violin bow down the edge. Here are some more of the patterns, are some, are some more examples of the patterns that she found on a square plate and then, and then a circle. And these are also examples of resonance. At just the right frequency, we see these remarkable patterns. You could think of the vibrations as creating standing waves in the plate. There are hollows where the salt can rest and mounds where the salt bounces away. And none of this is new. Napoleon hosted such demonstrations over 200 years ago in the late 1700s. And the scientist musician Ernst Kladny was paid very well to, to share his sound figures with the court. And you can see here the mounted plate and, uh, and the violin bow. With Napoleon looking on. 100 years later in the 1920s we discover similar beautiful resonant vibration patterns in atoms or Big Bang and stardust as we, as, we now, as we know atoms to be and in the workshops the children often say they're reminded of flowers, fruits and butterflies and these beautiful forms actually are the origins of the colours and structures of our world. 200 years ago, Napoleon offered a prize to someone who could write the mathematics of these vibrating forms. And only one person submitted an entry, the French mathematician Sophie Germain. And she refined her submission and was awarded the prize on her third attempt. In those days, as a woman, she could not attend the university and was not even allowed to attend the academy that gave her the prize. Here's another mathematician, Emmy Noether. She was born nearly 140 years ago in 1882 to a Jewish German family and suffered from sexism and racism 
throughout her life, which, which you can read about. But what I'd like to focus on is her remarkable and important contribution to science. Her work is so important that it, is, it has transformed the way a great deal of modern physics is done, particularly the physics that tries to understand the tiny building blocks of the universe. Yet she barely features in our education system. So I'm going to try and explain what she did. I think most of you have heard of the conservation laws of energy and momentum. Uh, they seem to apply everywhere in the universe and are a powerful way to look out at the world and work out what is going on. And Emmy gave us a new way to think about these. So I've sketched, I've sketched this simple grid. The bottom axis is about space. We have here and there. And the vertical axis is about time. We have today and tomorrow. And this is a red square, which is some experiment that I'm running. And what Emmy discovered what it was that if my experiment here works exactly the same as my experiment does over there, then momentum is conserved. And if my experiment works the same tomorrow as it does today, then energy is conserved. And these situations where things remain the same here and there, today and tomorrow, are called symmetries. It seems absolutely blindingly obvious to us that an experiment done today will be the same tomorrow. But the universe doesn't need to be like this. There are plenty of other more subtle symmetries that define our universe. And the direct relationship between symmetries and conservation laws discovered by Emmy means that now, whenever scientists discover a symmetry or a conservation law, they're looking for its partner. And this is called Nertus theorem. It is incredibly powerful and helps us better understand our universe. So I'd like to close part three by sharing some photos from my studio of large oil paintings. They are also about nature's hidden patterns. This time, a very subtle one. So here you can see the original design, which I then slowly made into a painting. And each picture is about 1.8 meters high and contains thousands of elements. This is the finished painting. It, I like to think of it as a kind of magic carpet. It's made of lots of small triangles. And since that design, I've had fun experimenting with different color combinations. This is a detail for this one. The colors were inspired by a painting by textile artist Annie Albers. This orange and gold on magenta took its influence from a sunset. And here is blue sky and a garden with different borders. These paintings show the relationship between a tiny particle of matter, the top band, and one of light, the bottom band. The top and the bottom borders are very simple, random mixes of two colors of semicircles. There is really nothing to see. The interest only occurs in the middle band, which overlaps the top and the bottom patterns and reveals a subtle wave. It is as though you and I were repeatedly tossing coins in different countries, each getting nothing interesting. Half the time heads, half the time tails. The interesting relationship emerges only when we put our results together and look at the whole. We have discovered that nature can have delicate connections that span space and time. And here, is a detail. We are adventurers. Let's return to this present moment in the last quarter of a second of the universe's first year. I was curious to see what, what subjects you might be studying and I visited the LEH website. I felt it would give me a clue as to how humans currently see the world. 
and I found that you can each choose to study four A-level subjects for two years. And they were all listed alphabetically like this. There are multiple ways to organize such a list. My first instinct was to group together the subjects I would call expressive. These are the ways that we have to talk about our world and our experiences. So all the languages, music, art and theatre. Then I gathered together what I call knowledge subjects, specifically knowledge of nature in green and knowledge about the world humans have made in, in the last mostly 12 seconds of the universe's first year in blue. And I put maths in the middle. It, it is primarily a knowledge subject with its own internal logic knowledge, but it also has an element of, of aesthetics. To my mind, the expressive subjects go hand in hand with the knowledge subjects. Expressive subjects can be applied to any knowledge subject. Why would we not use dance, for example, to describe the different states of water, or some notion about atoms and stars, or how a great painting makes us feel? Some things seem to be missing. Maybe you've had the same thought. What about writing? How can we become writers, reporters, debaters, storytellers, and expressive beings? And poetry, this vital subject that finds similarities and gaps between things and captures ambiguities and experience. And I had other, I, I had other ideas too. It would be wonderful to study patterns or, or trees, for example. This is our last guest, sculptor Alexander Calder for he is my favorite artist and brought art, engineering, life and nature at every scale together. He's the inventor of the mobile and Einstein supposedly stood before one of his works called A Universe for 40 minutes and said, I wish I had thought of that. Alexander Calder trained as an engineer and was the most talented student in his year. And then he trained as an artist. He loved to dance, argued strongly for justice, and his works are a type of poetry. Here is his mobile, Snow Flurry, from 1950. So to close, I'd like to zoom out again, not so much in time this time, but into outer space, to the edges of our Milky Way galaxy. This is a picture taken by the Voyager spacecraft in 1990 as it left our solar system. The tiny dot in the right bright band is our home, the Earth, seen from six billion kilometers. Let's playfully imagine we are aliens for a moment. From our distant perspective out here in the universe, what might we propose that humans spend their time studying for an hour, a month, a year or a lifetime in the classroom, lab, studio or forest? Here are my first alien proposals planet, for there is nothing like their beautiful planet. Mind, they have evolved complicated minds, yet their management of them is primitive. Ramani Kayal, whose drawings I showed in part one, said rather inspiringly, every man can, if he so desires, become the sculptor of his own brain. Poetics, the human mind can ex experience, appreciate and communicate the rich textures of existence. Yet humans do not place much emphasis on this. Patterns. Humans have begun to understand the order that underpins our universe. This can bring surprising knowledge and ignite a sense of meaning and beauty. 
kindness. There are over 100 humans in every square kilometer of habitable land. Though they are quite similar to one another, they believe they are quite different. They need to find a peaceful and enjoyable way to value one another. Life navigation. Humans possess diverse character and talents and their lifespans are relatively short. They tend to think about their time in unsophisticated ways. In physics, we call the journey of something through time and space a world line. Everyone has their own unique world line. This 1954 painting by Argentinian artist Carlos Caroli seems to capture this idea beautifully. Each wavy line is a lifetime traveling rightwards through time and it meanders through space up and down as it goes. Each colored circle might be a significant event. Notice how individual each line is. I like the feelings of flexibility, playfulness, experiment, resilience, generosity and optimism it captures and its beauty. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I'll close with one of the best opening lines ever, thanks to the poet Pablo Neruda. Every day you play with the light of the universe. Hello, I think we're back on. Can you hear me, Geraldine? Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful. Uh, that was uh, incredible. Um, it's, uh, it, it is uh, fascinating to see your perspective on how things can be knitted together. Um, I'm just getting my device set up to... I don't know, um, if the, did some of the slides freeze? They did at my end a little bit, maybe with some of the big paintings. I think they're so complicated. They took a while to come through here, but maybe, maybe you didn't have the same experience and the audience. They did. They did a little bit, um, but um, we. I'm, this has been recorded, and I've got your presentation anyway. And this will be going onto the STEM website, and everyone will be able to see it again. And I'm certainly going to see it again. So that's uh, that's uh, it's going to be worth it for uh, all of us. Um, okay, I'm going to just try and set up. Let me see. I want to be able to see the question. So if you please, if I could ask the audience to tap your questions into the chat. I'm going to set myself up so I can see that, trying to coordinate um, various buttons and things all at once. Um, bear with me two seconds. OK, so now I can... Um, the questions as they arise. Um, one, uh, just to get us started, one that I was interested in is that um, it seems to be a, a time like never before when the whole country is seeing what our natural national curriculum looks like because they're having to homeschool. And I've been listening on the radio to people who suddenly seem to be aware, non-teachers, I mean, teachers are in their own little boxes, but suddenly people who don't work in the teaching business uh, are saying, well, is this curriculum fit for purpose? Um, and of course, it's a decision we've made carved in stone that it has to be this way. But we forget when we've existed with things for so long. And I was wondering um, what your view was on the future of the curriculum. How do you think we should progress from this moment forward? Uh, it's a brilliant question, Mr. Britton. And um... I mean, I don't have an answer to it right now, but I have had the same experience. I have friends who are teaching their children at the moment, and they are saying to me the curriculum is driving them mad for various reasons. I think they feel that they're teaching things that don't seem important, and they're not teaching things that do seem important. Um, 
But maybe my perspective is that we probably need to approach it slightly differently. So before this talk, I did sort of, I'm not an expert in the curriculum, and I did cast around a little bit. I, I didn't actually know who wrote it, for example. And I discovered, it seems to me, that there are some academics in Cambridge, coupled with maybe some teaching support and the government, government ministers. And my first thought was, well, well, and, and also the other observation I made was when I looked at the objectives for A-levels, it seemed to be about um, making uh, assessments so that employers and universities can select people. Um, and so that th this, this seemed to be very much kind of the main objective of the A-levels when I looked into the documentation. And so it struck me, well, first of all, who should be deciding on the curriculum what it should be? And, it, and my first thought was, well, we should have a philosopher and a poet and uh, some, some uh, medical staff and a gardener, maybe, as well as, all of, the, uh, as all, of, all of these other people that are involved. We should have this balance. It's a, it's a human decision uh, about what we want to do with our education system and what we want to give people. Um, and so I think probably my answer to your question is one of approach that we probably need to stand back and think about things afresh. Um, I think from my understanding, it seems that our education system is, is, has evolved from maybe sort of like industrial, the industrial area, the modern educational system. So it's producing a workforce. Uh, but I think maybe we do need to think again and have a different group of people thinking about it, certainly in addition to the people that currently do that this is something for our humanity. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it seems more and more the case. And if people are complaining about it, maybe we should be looking at what we can get out of uh, all of the nonsense we've had over the last uh, over a year now and think, well, how could we change things going forward? What do we now see under a different light, you know, in a different light? Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting. That that part I was very interested in. You, we were critiquing our um or not ours in particular but the, the the way the curriculum is broken down and maybe misses some crucial bits and stresses things and you you were saying that um it looks very much like the school curriculum is designed to provide a a, a route into university rather than any genuine benefit itself which is quite that's uh, yes uh, it's nice to be part of the system i suppose um okay um now, I was also intrigued by you. You're so creative, and the way you you look at the world is so original. Um, and I, that that I'd never seen that 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 curve, the way you're presenting data and intensity of light by the by those little images. And um, how do you get your inspiration? Where does that come from? Usually from a question. Um, so, we, which curve were you talking about exactly? Uh, the the large kind of it, black body shape? It, or the... Yes, it was the black body distribution. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it, that was um, just an example for that one. You know, usually what happens is I, I might have a question, so why is something the way it is? But with that one in particular, it was, you know, the black body, that shape, everybody, that, that graph of photons that I was showing is, is a really important shape because basically it's, it's everything with a temperature, so I have the temperature, uh, has its own light spectrum and it's dictated exactly the shape by the temperature. It's called the black body. Uh, but I was thinking, well, we, you know, we understand light now to be like raindrops, like photons. It comes in little, uh, little pieces. And but yeah, yet I'd never seen it shown like that. And it seemed like a really obvious way to show it. If light is arriving like droplets, why don't we draw it like that? And actually, when you do draw it like that, you get a slightly different profile. Uh, it does look a little bit different. But it just it was just my question to a physicist. Well, why don't we show the black body? Uh, and, and actually, our study of the black body sort of is very closely linked to this understanding of light arriving like raindrops. <laughs> Why don't we show it like that? And he uh, he looked at me like most scientists do when I first say these things rather quizzically, like I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, and then, um, but, uh, but then he took it seriously and went away and calculated it and said, oh, I think this is what it looks like. And then we just had tremendous fun since then making uh, making different ways of looking like it. And actually, he did say at the time, he said, I don't think anybody's ever done this before. And um, you can always do that. So if you go into science, people will often 
draw for you a chart the way it's always been drawn, the way history has always drawn the chart. And um, um, I find it really interesting to vary the conventions and to look at things even slightly differently. It's in a way it's quite a slight change that we made, uh, but it helps you see the world in a in a different way. Um, yeah, so that's I think I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, it, it does. Um, so it, that was through conversation and sort of reviewing things through different eyes, I think. Uh, yeah, I do spend the time in my lessons uh, saying, well, this isn't maybe the best way to present it, but it's the way it's done. I was working with binding energy the other day and they always do it the wrong way up. Um, and it doesn't really make sense, that graph. Uh, it needs interpretation. And to some extent, as you were referring to the machine earlier, it does make me think that maybe uh, it's open to interpretation so that I have a job. You know, that's a terrible thing to think. I don't no, really mean actually, that. But, but just on that point, uh, I think it's brilliant that you spend time doing that interpretation because it's so easy, so often, I mean, when I think back to my own science education, things were just chalked up and then they disappeared and I've sort of left with this feeling of dissatisfaction. And one of the things uh, that, that my project has allowed me to do is to go back to universities and not feel... Um, like I should have all the answers and people say well Geraldine she's, Geraldine is a strange creature like she's an artist and and she's forgotten a lot of physics <laughs> and so I can turn up and ask these questions that I might actually when I was 19 20 have been really afraid to ask because someone would have said well we did that last week did you not look at your notes and um, so I have this strange position where I can also just walk out of someone's office if they're not doing the job for me and go and find someone else and um, <laughs> and ask and ask these questions uh, and keep pushing actually kind of annoyingly when I feel that the answers aren't coming out. And so, um, yeah, just very fortunate. No, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And I think um, I usually gauge uh, how much the person knows about the subject when you question them how cross they get <laughs> if they get if they get cross at the question that probably means they can't really address it and uh you'd i doubt them rather than the the questioner no you're uh, absolutely that, right you absolutely right. i just want to comment on that so i find that there are certain scientists i go back to again and again and they are without a doubt the best scientists that i know doing some of the best work and yet if i ask them a question that maybe some might say well that seems like a trivial thing they will really settle and think about it. They're very deep thinkers and they're honest thinkers and they don't mind saying that they don't, it needs more thought. Um, it's the sort of personality that I think, um, yeah, like you say, it's very happy to do that. And it, it, very quickly with physics, you can, and science in general, you can quickly reveal that we, it's very easy to find areas that we don't, we still don't understand because we so often just pick up tools and use them. Absolutely. The shut up and calculate mentality, which I've never thought was a great way to do it. Um, we have a question here from a student who's posted on the, the chat. Uh, how did you become interested in showcasing science through art? Well, uh, I guess there's a couple of ways to answer that. The first thing is, you know, I did study the physics and I enjoyed it, although I felt that I was dissatisfied with the way I learned it and I, had, I felt like I hadn't come away with much and yet I felt it was a very special subject and I felt science was a very special subject because it requires us to be very careful and humble in the way we look at the world. So um, when I graduated from art I thought well look I have this unique opportunity to return to that. I have some knowledge of it so let's try and complete the job and go back to it and I also felt from the other side that um, there was a lot that humanity could learn from the scientific approach. So when I say that there's a various factors, I'm sure I'm gonna forget some important ones, but that way of objectively looking at the world, not jumping to conclusions, really thinking carefully about our facts, thinking carefully about how we're measuring things, um, is that, that kind of type of careful experimentation over the long term, seeking to genuinely understand something. I mean, I, I have to think that that mindset has potential for so many different fields. Um, and then there are other aspects that come with doing science, which is you are absolutely ready. I and mean, it's kind of, you don't really find this in any other fields to bin something that you might have 
believed for the last 50 years is the best view of the world, but something better comes along and you are prepared with new information to rewrite that and adopt a new perspective. And so it's a really, um, it requires a really flexible way of thinking. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about doing science. It doesn't bin the previous model. The previous model still applies, but under, under certain parameters. Um, it's, um, you're constantly trying to say, what's the best way to talk about this? Can we think about this in another way? You're walking around and looking for other perspectives. Um, and I actually uh, think all of these things are worthwhile talking about in terms outside of science. And, I, and they're also values that I use a lot in my art as well, actually. And I've picked up a few other things from scientists, which is just always to work calmly and to find the right questions. Um, that's an art form and sci good scientists do that. They spend a lot of time thinking, what are we asking here? Why are we asking it? Um, yeah, hope that answers your question. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's a creative process in itself, isn't it? That asking of the question, what's the right question to ask? Yes, I mean, it's so interesting. I work with scientists who've been doing this a long time now, and that really is, is a great part of their art, because particularly with experimental work, where you might spend 5, 10, 15 years building an experiment, you only have so many experiments you can build in your lifetime. Uh, you're forever... And, and you're, it's not just your life you're, you're, you're spending, it's, it's the people who work with you, their lives. <laughs> And, 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 and these things can be expensive. So you're forever sort of saying, which is going to take me in the right direction? And it's partly hunch and experience, uh, and obviously partly, partly data. But yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, sometimes you get answers that will take you somewhere else, totally unexpected. You'll get a different answer to a different question. <laughs> yeah, that, yes. I, and that's a, sort of a, a curiosity-led science. Do you think that we've lost a little bit of the curiosity-led science? I have the image of Newton fiddling away with, with whatever took his fancy, um, but mm -hmm. now we seem to have big, big uh, investment, big projects. And I know that um, sort of the, the, the investors govern the research, but do you think maybe we should, maybe the artistic route could be a route for more creative based? Investigations. Well, we're in an interesting situation where science, um, you know, some of the low hanging fruit has gone. I mean, I'm not saying what, what Newton did was low hanging fruit, but, uh, you know, we do to understand, say, the very beginning of the universe. One way is to build these huge particle accelerators, for example, at Geneva. Um, and there are problems with that because, so, for example, I work with scientists who are investigating very similar questions but in a much more economic way um, in the laboratories at Imperial College in a kind of low energy way. Um, and I see them struggle for funding because there's, it's, there's, there's this funneling of funding to the really big projects. And the really big projects can be absolutely amazing, but they can really create a vacuum um, in other areas. And almost they're too big to stop funding as well. Um, there's that side. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I work with a particular group of scientists at the moment who are quite fleet of foot and quite nimble and different types of science are available to different scientists. So you can work at CERN with, I think it's 6,000 scientists, I forget the number. Anyway, um, I know that they have video conferences with hundreds of scientists on. Uh, or you can be parts of small teams that are much fleet of foot, maybe six people, whatever. Um, so I think I think the full scope of opportunity is there now, actually. But I think, yeah, just possibly guard a little against this sort of melon in the fruit basket effect, which is, are these huge scientific projects, which are incredibly exciting and also international, as is all science, really. That's lovely. And I love the fruit uh, references. So that was twice. <laughs> Did it there. I was I was just thinking to say that Newton had gone beyond low hanging fruit. It literally fell on him, didn't it? And uh, uh, I thought that well that that comment amused me. And then you came out with the melon in the fruit bowl, which was much better. Anyway, um, another student question: um, Is there anyone in particular that has inspired you with your your mission? That's a lovely question. Yes, yes, yes. Richard Feynman. Um, I don't know if you guys have watched Richard Feynman. Um, 
do you, do, you, do the students watch Richard Feynman, Mr. Britton? Uh, they're encouraged to an extended reading, um, but uh, not as part of the syllabus. Again, yeah. the correction. Okay, well, uh, watch any video with Richard Feynman. Um, in fact, he actually is a big part of why I returned to physics. I did a physics degree, would you believe, and then got into Richard Feynman after studying art, which is sort of mad. Um, um, so his name is F-E-Y-M-A-N. You don't have to be a physicist to enjoy him. Um, there's a whole load of things on the uh, on YouTube where he made a show for Horizon. And he just talks about, um, in his, he, he was a great physicist, Nobel Prize winner, and a very, very fresh thinker, very fresh way of thinking, and very interested in communicating how he, he thought and how science thought. So there are some, if anybody really is interested in how we look out at the world through physics, check out Richard Feynman, Messenger Lectures, Caltech, 1964, something like that. Um, black, little black and white lectures, um, and they're a real insight into the way physicists see the world. But he's super funny, and um, yeah, he inspired me a lot. And I know his dad was, um, his dad was a uniform salesman, but a great man and was a really big part of his education and the way he saw the world. So always, for example, that he tells a story where um, his, he and his dad were thinking about dinosaurs. And his dad said, let's not just talk about dinosaurs, let's think about how big its head would be if it came through your bedroom window. And he was always very big on visualizing, really thinking about what something meant um, and thinking deeply about it. Um, so yeah, Richard Feynman. He was a juggler and a bongo player as well. You'll see him mentioned for that. <laughs> I'm so glad you said him. He's my hero too. <laughs> I think he's, a, he's amazing as a communicator. He's one of my heroes. There, there are a few of them. There's lots to choose from. But Feynman, I love the favorite. My favorite quote is he'd rather. He said he'd rather have questions he can't answer than answers he can't question. And I just thought, what a lovely. Uh, brain explode what a lovely quote totally and totally a humble man you know he won the Nobel Prize he was not interested in it he said I don't need prize I've already got the prize I found the discovery is the prize and sharing it with other people is the prize uh, really amazing guy yeah yeah wonderful um, I have another student question um, how do you manage your time between your different interests how do you coordinate all of that <laughs> stuff you want to do um, I have a kind of flow now, actually, you know, so I, I have the brilliant uh, situation that I'm self-employed with all of the risks and problems that that entails. But I have a flow and um, a friend of mine who's a physicist once said to me that everything has its time and I try to go with that. So you guys, of course, can't because I was at the beginning, I was talking about all these milestones you guys have to meet. <laughs> I don't have that apart from things like this talk, which I prioritise. But um, I have a general flow, so um, um, subjects come up and go down in my mind and I find solutions to things that maybe I thought about two years previous. And um, I mean, now, for example, I was just introducing you to the ideas of Emmy Noether. I discovered her when I started this project, when I was talking to a theoretical physicist and he told me about her. Um, I really should have known about, about her. But now I'm thinking, this is 10 years on, I really want to do something about her work now. Can I visualise these ideas in some way? And so everything has a flow and a lot of the designs you saw today and there's plenty of others um, working with light lately has got me thinking about working with glass and stained glass and uh, doing things like that. So yeah, everything kind of has its time and things get finished and I suddenly feel the surge to start something new and I, I have an idea what it is. Um, and then sometimes things appear in my inbox, like this talk, and it feels like a really um, timely moment to make something like this for you guys. Um, yeah, and, and so it's a mixture of opportunity, keeping my eye open for things coming, and then kind of finding a sort of flow and a balance. For me, it's really about balance. If I'm not in the studio enough, I feel kind of bereft. If I'm not looking at new things enough I find it sort of problematic so I'm always kind of trying to keep this flow and then of course there's real life as well that needs to be balanced and, thro and thrown into the mix <laughs> but yeah kind of, a kind of flow thing and I have the, I, sometimes I draw a wheel 
on a sheet of paper what's happening in Geraldine's life, what are the key sectors in Geraldine's life. And I just, as long as things are on that wheel, <laughs> um, that tends to be how I think about things. <laughs> Well, well, that's uh, that's that's great. It's it's um, it's not easy to uh, to balance everything, and then you talk about real life as well. We uh, fortunately have to sometimes step down. I, I have another uh, student. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say that uh, the reason I came into Emmy Nurta, the the awareness of Emmy Nurta, quite late as well, and I think um, we both experienced a curriculum that didn't include her. I will keep coming back to the curriculum. We've got plenty we could include. We should all know about her, considering what a massive impact she had on science in the 20th century. So glad just, just to mention that, I mean, she she took, you know, you could say that the world of Einstein and, and other people like him was, um, um, and then the world of people like um, Lorenz, you know, she, come, she brought together two entire worlds of science um to bodies of men actually all men <laughs> and combine the two um made amazing yeah yeah remarkable and we should know about it um next question from the student body we have um many would argue that art is emotional communication beyond science how do you think this impacts science artwork well i can talk personally i mean i'm um i'm always looking for a um a feeling of joy actually in my work um, and celebration so I do think of my work as emotional work and although I'm working directly with scientific discoveries and findings um, I'm always I, I obviously have a lot of leeway in terms of what's the scale what's the material what are the colors um, which are all are kind of emotional signifiers and so I have a general feeling that I am looking for in my work and it's consistently uh, consistently that. Um, so that would be my answer to to that question. I would say my work is emotional, like some of those paintings, I mean they didn't come up so well on my screen so you, you guys can always visit, visit my website but there's a couple of large new paintings I've got in my studio at the moment and um, they have a feeling of kind of um, you know they're big uh, kind of gloriousness and um, and um, and that is a philosophy of my work. You know, I could, there's a lot of artists making emotional work, but you can, uh, by starting somewhere else, still make emotional work. Um, um, and that was my interest. I could go about making emotional work. There's a lot of people doing it, but why would I do that? There's a lot of people doing it. And so, um, but I'm very, very aware of it. I'm very aware of the impact of my work on people as well. And I'm looking for a kind of, um sublime joy like nature is singing and an appreciation um yeah, yeah. Your question uh, i think that did and just to reflect on your picture that you had someone in the gallery looking at your huge panels there what i find personally is that you looking at the screen image of a picture or a painting is nothing it, it's nothing to being there uh, feeling the whole environment and the size and scale and uh, seeing the swirls on the on the of the brushstroke of the artist it's uh, it doesn't match up being on the screen you can curate <laughs> everything on the screen but it's not the same uh, it's uh, you get a fraction of the emotion um so i'm all for that going to galleries and things um uh, next question um oh mr mangin Mangin contributing have a look at the lex friedman podcast and his interviews with roger penrose Michu kaku and sean carroll and um, all people that i uh, i do uh, admire um roger penrose if uh, anyone struggled through some of his books so good luck to you it's uh, he's a very very uh, deep deep thinker um uh, it's worth the effort i think anyway I next, a, pen, thank uh, you, mr. can i just say something Sorry. i recommend a piece of, of by Roger Penrose. Um, if any of you guys are head over to Oxford, I think it might be, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna know the name, the Mathematical Institute at Oxford, the entire front concourse was designed by Roger Penrose. It's beautiful, really beautiful. Um, I suggest you check it out if you are there. Is it his non-repeating tessellations? Exactly. That he's famous for. He, yeah, that was being translated into toilet roll, wasn't it? Which is, I thought, <laughs> what an interesting, overlay this post-postmodernism i think this is that's what it's called isn't it uh, anyway 
Um, uh, so this is another question from the floor. How can we go about breaking down pre-existing conceptions about the limits of disciplines and take a more interconnected approach in our everyday understanding? Did you follow all of that? Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, mm. I mean, sometimes, I mean, so, so for example, I, I don't have a proper answer to this, but if you think about a topic like the sun, uh, which is so important to us. Um, I don't know what you think, Mr. Britton, but I think you could probably teach almost all physics by thinking about the sun and our relation to it with it on Earth. Um, and I feel that um, some great narratives of our existence and our world are sort of lost in the education system. And also the philosophy that um, um, we train people to be scientists, but of course most people don't become scientists. And so as an adult, you'll go to parties and people will say, well, I didn't do science at school, so I don't understand anything about the world. And yet I don't I don't know why this information isn't available to everybody. Not everyone's going to be the scientist, but everyone should have the opportunity to understand it in their own way and express it in their own way. So I don't know what the answer is. You know, there's teaching science, teaching people to become scientists, but then there's also this opening door on science and letting people talk about it and explore it maybe slightly more freely. Um, sometimes I think the, the model of education I see in junior schools is kind of more akin to where we need to be in general. I don't know, I'm prob probably saying rather shocking things, but just the way that um, children um, very, very naturally, they don't see any subject boundaries. They just um, want to study the sun, they want to think about the sun, and they totally expect to be able to do an experiment and then make a painting about it that afternoon. And at that point, you are turning knowledge into, um, into meaning to, and creating emotional connections. And um, at the moment, I think we're heavy on the knowledge. And people at universities, I know, say we teach them too much. Um, but then where's the meaning? And maybe the meaning comes when you have time to express things in your own way, which is what Richard Feynman was great at doing. He always thought incredibly deeply about expressing things in his own way and for other people. Um, and possibly it's that emphasis on expression and learning at the same time in finding new ways and, and reducing the emphasis possibly, maybe teachers deal with this all of the time, that when you look at the syllabus there's a sense of piecemeal things. Mm -hmm. And yet, where do they fit into the big narrative? I mean, we haven't spoken about this, Mr. Britton, but I think you knew that I did this exercise. I was thinking about, oh, Geraldine, what, what are the themes that I've really enjoyed in the last 10 years? And then I, I wrote them down and I, I Googled through the syllabus and so many of the things that struck me weren't, weren't even listed. Um, these were the great narratives of, of, that I picked up since returning to science weren't listed in the syllabus. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm answering things in a rather messy way, but I guess it's about the big narratives. It's about different forms of expression. Um, yeah, with, and maybe maybe thinking things in a different way. Let's do a project about the sun, but let's explore it in, in all the different ways that we can explore the sun. You know, there's we can think about the processes that light it up. We can think about the spectrum that comes off it. Uh, we can think about how the particles come to the Earth and create the aurora borealis. We can think about its great gravity. Um, and we can talk about that with mathematics and with science. We can study the atomic spectra that comes off it, um, and we can and we can talk about it with poetry. Um, and maybe you know, we need to think about that kind of way of organising ourselves, possibly. Right? Yeah, I I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, I was, somebody I was reading recently was talking about the curriculum narrowing students uh, to the A-levels where they've got a very small choice and then opening the doors to the university and saying no you can pick any one of these um, and of course they've already narrowed themselves and all this vast opportunity is not available. I must, I must say that yeah I mean I do it's very very interesting uh, analogies I mean I do when I when I do work with people at universities I'm very aware that they've kind of gone through a selection of like we're all being pushed through fine needles aren't we we're all totally different yet we're all going through these tiny <laughs> needles and by the time you meet people at university they've gone through a lot of tiny needles um, and um, and any and they've made a lot of sacrifices they've got some you know quite a lot of people just to go through these needles they've dropped a lot of stuff they have, have had interest in uh, and you do often see that with people, they get through all the needles and then they have more freedom and then they start to sort of open back out again. <laughs> um, 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all that opportunity comes after school. Uh, you've got all these things you can look at. I've got more questions here. Um, uh, how would you encourage us to begin to view the world in this way, in your way? What would be the steps you'd suggest to expand their viewpoints? Well, I mean, follow what you're interested in, first thing. And then I think um, when you're trying to understand some, something, um, figure it out in your own way, you know, say it in your own way. Um, you're being asked, I, I understand, you know, to pass exams and write things down in a certain way is how you get results. I've just actually done a German exam. So I, I, for after many years, you know, returning to doing an exam is a very interesting experience for me, you know, and I learned that a lot of what you have to do is about the exam. It's not about my fluency in German. Yeah. Um, and so, and I, so I understand to some extent the pressure you're under, but yeah, it's really about trying to attach meaning to the information that you're receiving, to figure out what interests you, and and don't ignore that sense of um, discontent when you feel you're not getting something out of something. That's not actually often you. That's to do with the way you're being taught or the way the information is being presented to your brain because we've all got different brains. Um, and so don't feel that um, if something isn't, there's a cognitive dissonance, it's, it's to do with you. It, it's, it, could, it can be a matter of looking around and finding a different way to say it. And actually now with the internet, that's the amazing thing, you can keep do, drilling around, looking around. Uh, but it is tricky because there's a lot of, uh, particularly with science, there's a lot of science seems to be articulated in an in a particular way, in science videos, for example. Um, and um, you just have to be quite judgmental in where you look. It's tricky, but yeah, take an interest in what interests you and enjoy it and, and express ideas the way you want. And I think try and keep an interest, if you have it, in, in forms of expression, if it's poetry, if it's dance, if it's music, keep that going side by side with your other interests and Try not to separate them. See the subjects that you're studying um, as source for ideas. Um, think metaphorically, think po poetically. I mean, it's funny, all those little light prints I was showing you, um, on your syllabus, I think it's just listed as pinhole camera. I think that's right, Mr. Britton, on A-level syllabus. Yeah. Yeah. Pinhole. So I was working with pinhole, but you know, I, I turned it into an art technique. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, making light prints and also uh, open that right out and I, if you are interested in pinholes everybody just google Bob Miller at the Exploratorium he is brilliant on images in space he was an artist in residence there 20 years ago maybe more 40 years ago uh, but yeah you know so even little things hidden in the syllabus might offer you something for your artwork that's, that's every, cool. every graph you know every graph um, has, a, has an absolute beauty. It's the most amazing thing that humans look at the world and can measure this and measure that, put the two together and find a relationship. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Um, can be very beautiful. So yeah, stay open-minded about where beauty is. Uh, I totally agree with that. I mean, why not experiment with different graphs and how to present data and play around with it? Um, it doesn't have to all be the same, does it? Um, by the by the way, I preferred your term of selector for pinholes. Um, that's 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 got that's more evocative, isn't it? To call it a well, that's, I, I will just comment on that. I mean, when you do study physics, so much of the language is historic language. It's literally as humans discovered it. So you know, you've probably heard electrons called beta particles, and that can things like that. Even that can be confusing. And you know it's totally, it, and, and these these terms stay because there's a whole body of scientific uh, discourse built on that. But uh, you can challenge them, and uh, they're not always helpful. And and look for that, expect that they're not all, they're not helpful to learners. No, um, we've got just a few minutes left. Uh, there's another question from the floor. Do you think of looking at science in, or you think that looking at science in this way as a combination of subjects and ideas as opposed to more rigid mathematical ways could lead to a new wave of scientific discovery in the future i don't know you know i mean i um 
Um, science is, is doing pretty well um, on its own. Uh, it's a tremendous system so, and it works really well. But I will say this, that um, it's brilliant at discovering new things. Um, and of course it is where it is at the moment. It could have taken a different path. We might write our understanding in different ways, but um, I think the opportunity that is just ga a gaping hole is that while scientists are really busy discovering new things, there's an opportunity to discover new ways to talk about what we know. And that's as important as discovering new things, actually, I would say, a and as exciting. They are discoveries. And that's where I see the real opportunity to, um, to talk about our knowledge. And that is a kind of scientific endeavor. My work's quite analytical and uh, it involves reading scientific reports and then working with scientists to chart things in different ways. Um, and that could then have this effect of feeding back into science as scientists see things differently and maybe make a slightly different way interpretation of their work. But I, I think science is doing pretty well. Who can say? I'll let you know if I make any discoveries through my work. <laughs> well, actually, that feeds into my, uh, my final question, actually, which is what would you like your legacy to be? Your contribution to the world line you are busily creating. What would you like to to have the uh, the summary be what's Geraldine Cox contributed <laughs> to the world I might have to email you about that but you know I guess um <laughs> I'm really interested in people in in um helping people see things anew and see the world uh with fresh eyes and feel free to explore the world they want to explore it I'm really interested in freedom and happiness and contentment and helping a few people do that so if any of you guys if I've helped any of you guys and can help you um you know that's enough of a legacy for me as well as to do very little damage more good than than harm I'd say <laughs> yeah that, uh, to, I've, to, keep, to keep discovering sorry Mr Britton just to keep uh -huh. finding out new things and sharing them um and like I say finding out new ways to talk about things and sharing those so just to leave a generally optimistic positive feel well i think i think you definitely have i've had a few conversations with you and each time i come out buzzing and thinking <laughs> this is amazing i'm so you know uh, i we're so attuned I, I think what you're saying is just so important and you're yeah definitely a good world line to hold up as a model for the others um uh, I, so I just to conclude, I'd say thank you so much for giving us your time today. It's been it's been amazing. I hope the students have, um, have really got something from it. And I don't think they could have failed to, to be honest with you. I think what you're saying is uh, is just uh, so important to get them to to view the world differently. And your your what you're contributing is great. Um, you did say you're happy for them to contact you. Um, if they have further questions. So I see more and more appearing as we're chatting. So I will forward those to you, but they can access your email, can't they? That'll be available on the end of your um, PowerPoint, when, uh, your video when I present it. Okay, well, we've, we've come to the end of the time. Thank you so much. Uh, in, enjoy the rest of, well, uh, I wasn't gonna say your world line, it sounds a bit dark, but <laughs> enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, everybody. Thanks for listening. And yeah, feel free to drop me a line. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. I really enjoyed that, Andy. That was great. I really enjoyed it. Good. I think she's amazing. We we uh, she's got such a clear view on on things, I think. I think. The fact that she kept um, learning all this time is the key, isn't it, Mr. Manager? Yeah. Keep, keep learning. Um, anyway, she's great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for coming. See, Thank see you. you later. Wait, wait. Thanks for organising, Mr. Britton. That was really good. Very interesting. Pleasure. Uh, hello, properly, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah, very interesting. I was, I was trying to download Mox at the same time, but. That I was there, uh, yeah. Really, I, I just think the whole idea of having someone who can span different fields as a, a different way, a more open way of thinking than perhaps than we used to, is really good. Yeah, inspiration.
Yeah, I think so. Um, so you know, I, I hope she's got the she's in part of the Q and A uh, next week. Yeah, uh, week after, isn't it? So we'll get some more with her. For that, she'll be in conversation with someone who's focused their entire lives on uh, medicine and someone who's been scientific their whole life. Yeah, uh, research oceanographer. Be quite interesting to see the mix of viewpoints. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was really interesting. Anyway. Cheers. Thank you. Good. See you later. Bye.